So today, what I'm going to talk about are kind of the you know, bigger philosophical questions about crypto. Like, what it means for a crypto system to actually be secure. Um, I say my encryption system is secure. What does that mean? What kind of arguments can I make that's actually secure? I'm just going to talk about you know, how we actually prove secure. Um, you, know, you hear proof thrown around a lot, and sometimes things are supposedly proven and later broken. And you know, what does it actually mean to prove something in you know, a theoretical sense? And you know, while I'm talking about proofs, I'm going to bring this topic of zero knowledge proofs. I'm going to give a kind of brief outline of what that means and why it's important to cryptography and why it's interesting. Then finally, kind of the big question is, does cryptography even exist? This is kind of a complex question. Of what does it imply if, if there are actually are you know, ciphers and signature schemes and uh, public key encryption? What does that mean to kind of complexity of, uh, of languages out there? So what does secure actually mean? And one kind of side question is, would you trust a crypto system that leaked even a single bit? Your plain text. And this is a good standard to use to measure you know, whether it's secure. If you can't even tell one bit from a ciphertext. And better, if you can't even tell two ciphertexts apart, um, you're not going to be able to get information about the contents of the messages. So if you take the bar and set it and say, okay, we want this encryption scheme to actually not leak any information or give you any information that can distinguish between two ciphertexts, then we're going to consider it secure. And so this idea kind of came up about 25 years ago um, with two researchers named uh, Sylvia McCall and Shaka Goldwasser. And they kind of came up with this game. And so kind of going back to Kirchhoff's principle of the only thing being the secret, that's kind of the idea behind this game. And the way it works is that Alice is going to generate a public key. So this could be, you know, RSA, uh, any sort of public key schemes. Another way you look at it is that she could give Bob an oracle. So she might be using a uh, symmetric key system that can just give him some black box that will answer, answer questions. And uh, it'll be an encrypting oracle. So she generates his public key and gives it to Bob. And then what Bob can do is he can use that public key as much as he wants. He can encrypt messages with it. He can you know, feed in garbage. He can do all sorts of things with it. He can basically sit there and encrypt any chosen plain text that he wants. Then finally what he's going to do is going to decide on two different messages. These are his two challenges. And it's M0 and M1. He's going to send those to Alice. Then what Alice is going to do is just flip a coin and pick heads or tails and encrypt whichever message comes up. So at message B, uh, she's going to encrypt that with her public key and send the ciphertext to Bob. Now the game here is that given just the ciphertext and this encryption oracle, Bob's job is just to guess what bit she flipped. And, you know, in practice, it's called indistinguishability under a chosen plain text attack. In the shorter term, kind of easier to say, it's semantic security. And this is the idea that uh, Goldwasser and McCallie came up with 25 years ago. The idea is that if you look at these ciphertexts, and I give you everything, I give you an encryption oracle, I give you the public key, I give you the algorithm, I give you everything except this bit B, the secret key. You can't even tell two ciphertexts that you chose the plaintext for apart. Now the question is, you know, how does this relate to actual crypto systems we talk about? We talked about RSA, AES, a little about DES in the past. You know, are these things <coughs> medically secure? And let's look at RSA. So, you know, in this example, um, Alice is going to send Bob a public key. In this case, I've got 2701 and the X-Mix 5. And then Bob's going to pick two messages, let's say they're 10 and then 42, and send them back to Alice. She's going to pick a random bit, in this case, let's say it's zero, and so she's going to send back the encryption of the value 10 to Bob, and this is the value 63. But there's no randomization, so Bob can just as easily encrypt these two messages himself, and when 63 comes back, he knows that her bit is zero, so he's got to always win this game. So, you know, based on this very simple example, RSA is not semantically secure. And in fact, no crypto system that doesn't have some sort of randomization in the input is semantically secure because they've all got the same problem, where, where you can always distinguish between two ciphertexts that you chose. 
Now, kind of a side question is, do we even care about this? I mean, we use RSA, it's not semantic this but it is distinguishability that big of an issue? And in some cases, it is. So if you think about um, you know, anything where, kind of going back to that first assignment with the two-time pad, you know, where you can recognize patterns in the output, if I you know, use RSA or even AS in the ECB mode, I can see the same blocks of messages that I encrypt over and over, and I can distinguish between blocks. So that's where this idea of distinguishability is important. So going back to whether this matters for RSA, not, not always. I mean, sometimes you can use RSA in a case where it's a short message, where it's one block, and you don't care about distinguishability. Kind of the application we talked about last week it might be if you're trying to hide you know, the number of users. You just want to assign a you know, random user number that is invertible, so you can encrypt your, your real user numbers and then you know, pass around these RSA encrypted user numbers. And you don't even care if people recognize the same user here. You just want to hide how many you have. So distinguishability isn't an issue in every case, but you know, it is an important uh, kind of level of security that you can talk about. So you know, what is semantically secure? And so an early example is a crypto system called Elgamal. And I've kind of got you know, all the details up here, but it's very similar to the Diffie Helmet <coughs> key exchange key that we talked about. In this case, your secret key is just a value S. And then your public key is going to be an element, a yeah, generator in that group. So sorry, the uh, system parameters are a group and a generator in that group. And your public key is just going to be that element, the generator, to the exponents. So, you know, if I give somebody this value H, which is your public key, and a message, the way that they encrypt is that they're going to pick a random value. And this is the important part. So as I mentioned before, no deterministic crypto system is semantically secure. So they're going to pick this random value R and raise, um, raise the raise the uh, generator to that exponent R, and then also raise the public key to R and multiply the message m by the public key raised to r. So that's the uh, <coughs> fourth line, fourth bullet down. And the output's going to be these two values that say c and d. That's just an abbreviation. So now somebody decrypting c and d can take the value c, and they know the secret key s, and erase c to the s. And then they get the public key <coughs> to the value r. And they can divide the value d by that, and they get back the original message. This is some very nice problems. And in the next slide I'll talk about why, but it's semantically secure. And that's under a assumption that we talked about a bit first week. It's this Diffie Hellman assumption. And we'll talk about the next slide. Another nice property is that ciphertexts can be re-randomized. So if you look at the encryption function there, somebody who knows G and H can multiply in G and H values and then change what that exponent is. And then something can still be encrypted. This is kind of nice is that I can take a ciphertext and re-randomize it and pass it along. And it can hide you know, the origin of that ciphertext. So if you think of something like Tor or these kind of mixed net things, you can have neutral third parties that can re-randomize ciphertext and pass them on and kind of hide where they came from. And next week we're going to have a guest speaker who's going to talk about some voting protocols. And some of these make use of this re-randomization. It's a very nice tool. Another nice property about this is home work. So I can take two ciphertexts. I can multiply them together, and I get an encryption and multiplication of messages. Uh, that can come up with some nice, you know, some nice properties in different protocols. Uh, another nice thing about this is it supports pre-computation. I can generate uh, values of H and G to different exponents and <coughs> table of this ahead of time. You know, compute this ahead of time and keep it you know, for very fast encryption. And the final thing is that it's conducive to zero knowledge proofs. And so there are some proof systems I'm not going to get into today, but this is a nice crypto system for them. So, I like Elgin Hall uh, a lot. It's a very nice, elegant construction. So how do we actually prove that this particular crypto system is uh, semantically secure? So first I'm going to talk about two assumptions. And these are computational and decisional diffie helm So the computational diffie helm problem is if you remember back in the first week we talked about diffie helm key exchange, you're given an instance of a generator, a generated to an exponent A, generated exponent B. And your job is to output, output g to the a times b. And this is a hard problem. And if you were able to solve this problem, you could also find discrete logs by reformulating. Now, kind of a, a 
easier problem is just decision, deciding uh, between two values. So again, given this g, g to the a, g to the b, I'm going to give you randomly either g to the power a, b, or g to some random c. And the decision will depend on the assumption is that the latter one is difficult. And we know some groups that we think it's difficult in, but it's not difficult in every group. So I'll talk about that in a minute. But the way that this reduction will work is that, let's suppose going back to that semantic security game, that Bob has a non-negligible advantage in guessing that bit. So if you can get, guess B with anything more than an exponentially small probability of success, then what we can do is you can take that semantic security game and kind of massage in a decisional Diffie Hellman input into it. And we can use him as an oracle to solve the DDH problem. And so the idea here is that if this crypto system were not semantic security, Elgamal specifically, then a lot of other mathematical assumptions would fit. So if we could have this Elgamal kind of black box that could you know, beat the semantic security game, then I could solve the decision on the Helman in a lot of different groups. That would be <coughs> surprising. Uh, you know, a lot of research has gotten into this, and uh, you know, people are think it's a hard problem. So one thing to note is that decision on the Helman doesn't hold in kind of a common group, which is just integers mod primes. Uh, it's actually easy to tell uh, between these two values, g to the a, b, g to the c. So it's important to actually do this in the, the right kind of group. So people can do this over certain subgroups of uh, ZP and um, you know, different curves and things like that. But it's kind of an interesting aside. So this is the idea of proof by reduction. So that if I have a crypto system, what I'll usually do is assume that it's not secure under some assumption that I'm trying to prove. And then I'll reduce some problem to it. So if it's an RSA, I can take a factoring instance. And if I say, OK, I've got a black box that can solve RSA or can break RSA, then I can use that black box to solve a factor. So this is a common technique is that I'll uh, use this hypothetical thing that can break the algorithm as an oracle to solve some hard problem. And this comes up again and again in a lot of different contexts. And it is kind of the general way that you would actually proves something secure on under one of these assumptions. So, you know, is semantic security the end all of security? And, you know, we, in that case, gave Bob the tool to, or the, the ability to encrypt whatever he wants. But what about decrypt? So, kind of a common attack is it's a lunchtime attack. And the idea here is that, you know, all of us have probably left our terminal unlocked at some point in time. Uh, some of you may have had somebody you know, send a message to the own the mailing list from your terminal. You know, it happens to everyone. So a lunchtime attack is you go to lunch, somebody sits at your computer and you know, can decrypt messages ahead of time. So it's not actually attacking you yet, but they're sitting there kind of pre-computing things, trying to encrypt. They don't, may not actually have a key, but you know, maybe you logged into something and they can encrypt or excuse me, decrypt whatever they want. So similar to the uh, semantic security game is that Except the difference is that in the beginning, Alice is going to give Bob access to both an encryption and a decryption oracle. So then Bob gets in there and talk to these oracles, and the encryption one might just be a public key, it also might be you know, a symmetric cipher behind some sort of glass box. But he gets in there and talk to both these oracles, he can encrypt whatever he wants, decrypt whatever he wants, and he can compute all the stuff and kind of be ready. And then he can decide on his challenges. So he can pick his two messages and send them to Alice. And at this point, Alice now comes back and locks the terminal, Bob no longer has actually the access to the decryption oracle. But now Alice is going to pick the random message B and send him an encryption of that. And afterwards, Bob now just has the public. He can just encrypt things after she gives him that access. And now he's going to try to guess it. So this is also called chosen ciphertext attack. And the idea is that Bob gets to choose ciphertexts that Alice um, has to decrypt. And it's called non-adaptive. Because after he does his messages, he can't adapt and start asking more questions. So this is called uh, chosen ciphertext attack of CCA, and because it's not adapted one, which for a kind of historical reason called CCA one. So it might say indistinguishability under CCA one secure. That's a security definition that is harder than semantic security because in this case, Bob is more powerful, so the crypto system has to be strong. Now taking this further, this is not adaptive. What about adaptive? So it's just like the lunchtime attack, except now, after Bob has sent Alice's challenges, he still has access to the decryption order. Now, now she's going to send him back an encryption of one of these two messages, but 
it would be kind of trivial to ask for the decryption of that. So kind of a, the one rule is that you know after she sends in this challenge, her oracle will decrypt anything except that specific message. So this is a very strong notion of security. Not only does Bob have the public key, the algorithm, he can decrypt whatever he wants, whenever he wants, except for one particular message. So if you had a crypto system that met this level of security, it's going to be very powerful. Now let's think about Elgamal going back to this. Would Elgamal be adaptively adapted chosen site protected attack security? It's CCA2. So would it be indistinguishable under this? And the answer is no. And it goes back to this idea that you can re-randomize and you can do homomorphic things. So let's think about how we attack this. Well, you know, Bob's going to give his public, Alice's going to give Bob his public key, GNH, and a decryption oracle D, so she's not giving him the value S. And Bob's going to send her two messages, M0 and M1. And she'll encrypt it, she's going to pick bit V again, and then send him GDR, and then MB times HDR. But if you remember, we could re-randomize this, and it's also homomorphic, we multiply something in there. So all Bob needs to do is multiply some value into the second part of the ciphertext, and then give it back to Dallas. Remember the rules of this game is he just can't give her back the exact ciphertext. You know, he can just tweak a bit in there and send it back to her, and then she'll decrypt it. So he's going to ask the oracle to decrypt, in this case, C, 2D, and he'll get back a decryption of value 2 times MB, and then he can trivially figure out what that message was. So Elgamal is not CCA2 secure. And the idea is that because the ciphertext is malleable, you can change it in a meaningful, in a meaningful way, um, you're never going to beat this game. So kind of an equivalent definition is that you're not malleable under the CCA2 assumption. And so this kind of ties back to what we talked about last week, where you never want ciphertext to be unauthenticated. If you can edit or alter ciphertext in a meaningful way, you're not going to be able to have this level of security. Because you always have this attack where if I can flip one bit, maybe I can get you to decrypt it. And obviously this is not necessarily a real setting, you don't have decryption oracles out there, but the idea that we're giving the adversary, Bob, as much power as possible, there's almost nothing else we can give Bob in this case. The only things he doesn't know are the secret key and it's bit B. He's trying to guess the bit B. That the idea is that we've given him so much power that if he can't break it with all these tools at his disposal, this is a very, going to be a very powerful crypto system. So the question now is do CCA1 and CCA2 crypto system or secure crypto system exist? And the answer is yes. Um, as I said, Algamal is not, but there's another crypto system called Kramer Shoot, which is based on the same assumption, the DDH, and it's a bit more complicated, but it's not, it's not too bad. And it is uh, proven to be CCA2 secure under this assumption. And what it's going to use are collision resistant hash functions, which we talked about in week one. And this is going to be a way that they can ensure that the ciphertext has not been uh, modified in a way that would allow somebody to use this decryption. So they have a very nice construction. And there's also a, uh, we'll talk about it in a second, there's a theoretical result that you can take any uh, semantically secure or lunchtime attack secure crypto system and use a zero knowledge proof to convert it to a CCA2 secure system. So there's kind of a mechanism to take any crypto system that's secure under these two weaker definitions and make it more into this harder security definition. So just to recap kind of the things we talked about, RSA, as I said, is not semantically secure. Elgamal is semantically secure, but not CCA2 secure. And one of the uh, exercises is actually to look at it and decide whether it's CCA1 secure, whether it's uh, secure against a malicious attack. Kramer shoot, which we haven't talked about, I just mentioned, is, is CCA2 secure. And last week we also talked about RSA OEP. We didn't go to any of the definitions of it, but this means uh, optimal asymmetric encryption paddock. And remember we talked about you can't just tack on a random block to RSA and expect it to be secure. So there's a construction out there that actually have a more you know, complicated padding scheme that makes RSA um, CCA2 secure under what's called the random world form. That's basically assuming that you have a hash function that is, looks random on top of it. So it's kind of the state you know, of how the kind of practical crypto systems relate to the security definitions. And uh, RSA OEP is commonly used, and uh, it's kind of you know, the standard that you use in this case. And, Things like Kramer Shoop and these things that are generated by zero knowledge protocols, uh, they're still pretty inefficient. So Kramer Shoop is pretty large secret text, and there's a lot of operations. But um, there are constructions that are, are getting more efficient than what we need to stand. 
So I mentioned zero knowledge proofs. And you know, what's a zero knowledge proof? And this is a major part of cryptographic research today. And basically, a zero knowledge proof is a system that gives you a way to prove that some statement is true or false without revealing anything else. So you know, the example this will come up in the next few slides, but I can actually convince somebody that something is true, but then they can't, they don't have no more information. They basically have one bit of information. So this is going to be a very powerful tool in a lot of cryptographic protocols and constructions. So kind of go through a very you know, simple example is this Alibaba's cave. So Alice is standing at the front of this cave, and there's a door in the back, which is just a straight line, is a magic door. She wants to prove to Bob, who's outside, that she actually knows the secret password that will open this door. So what she's going to do is, the first step, she's going to commit to one of these hallways. She's going to go down A or B, and Bob's going to wait outside. So she, you know, in this case, I think she goes down uh, B. And now Bob is going to come to the door, and he doesn't know which hallway she went down. And he's going to be challenging. She's, he's going to say, you know, A or B. And he's going to do this randomly. So what Alice is going to do is that if she actually knows the password, and she's in the wrong hallway, she can open the door and come out the right hallway. If he happened to say the hallway that she's in, then she can just go back the way she came. So if he said B here, she can just turn around and leave. If he says A, she has to open the door to get out. So in the next step, she's going to come out the hallway, and he's going to confirm that she came out the right hallway. So if you think about this, if they do this for a lot of steps, you know, if she keeps consistently getting the right hallway correct, and he believes that you know the door can only be opened by someone with a password, he's going to be convinced that she actually has the password. Because somebody who didn't know it, they must be very lucky, because every single time, they must have picked the right hallway ahead of time in order to come out the hallway. And so the interesting thing here is he doesn't learn anything. He doesn't know the secret password. He doesn't know anything except that she, there is a secret password, and she knows it. So let's look at a more uh, interesting example. This is graph three color build. So some of you are familiar with NP completeness and NP problems. This is a problem that is NP complete and uh, it's difficult. So the idea is we've got a graph, which are these, these vertices connected by edges, and we don't know an efficient way to tell wh whether you can color the nodes of this graph in three different colors. So this could be an arbitrary graph. In this case, it's, it's one that is three colorable. And the idea is that coloring means that no two edge, excuse me, no edge may have two vertices of the same color. So if you look at this picture, all the edges have two different colored dots on the ends. And answering whether an arbitrary graph is three colorable is a difficult problem. If you do that efficiently, then P equals NP. You've solved all these problems are now efficiently solved. So we believe this is hard to do in general. So let's suppose that Alice knows the three coloring of this particular graph, or any particular graph. And she wants to prove it to Bob. So we do it the zero knowledge proof scheme for this. And the way it would work is that she would first relabel all the nodes on her graph. So in this case, you know, the colors are essentially the same. They've just been like relabeled in a random way. And these could just be a permutation. It could be the same three colors, just you know, permuted randomly. Then what she's gonna do is she's gonna commit to each value. We haven't talked about bit commitments yet, but it's another cryptographic primitive that basically allows her to give somebody else a value. And she's going to hide what she commits to. But later on, she's going to be able to reveal, and there's no way that she can change the value she committed to. So the idea might be that I put you know, a 1 or a 0 in an envelope, seal the envelope, and hand it to you. You, know, you can't open it until, I guess, maybe a locked box is a good idea, but I can put it in a locked box, give it to you, and then I can't change the value that's in the Bound, and you can't open the box, and then when I want to reveal it, you do the key, you open the box. So she's going to commit to all these vertices, and what Bob is going to do is pick an edge at random. So if you remember the cave, the commit, commitment was going down those hallways, and the challenge was him picking which hallway. It's the same idea here. So he's going to pick an edge at random in this graph. And so you know, let's say he picks this edge that's kind of in the center of the graph. What she'll do is reveal the nodes. And Bob is just going to check that the two nodes have different labels. And that's all he's going to be able to check. And then what you're going to do is keep repeating this. And so if you think about what did Bob actually learn? Well, he learned that whatever she committed to, 
those two labels had a different color. So if he keeps doing this and gets enough trials, he's going to be convinced that there's a three color in this graph because each time he's, she's going to somehow, you know, have committed to two values that are different colors. Now, if the graph was not three colorable, then when she committed, there's going to be two nodes that are the same color. And there's a, you know, a significant chance that he might guess the edge that has the same color. And so if she's cheating, if you do enough trials with high probability, she's going to get caught. But if she's honest, she's going to be able to pass this test every single time. Yes, question? Did you repeat that? Did you repeat that? Why did you repeat that? Uh, she relabeled it because let's say she left all the nodes the exact same color. Then each time she does this, Bob would just learn the color. So relabeling it's a, a way of showing. So like, let's say next time, you know, he picked, I don't know if you can see the mouse that moment. They picked that edge next time. These are the same colors. You can learn, oh, okay, well, then that, that, that third color is, you know, green or whatever. But if she relabels it, then this node that's common is going to be a different color each time. And he's not going to know which set it was in the first case. So that's actually an important part of the protocol. She has to relabel these things. If you go back to the cave example, that's why she picks a different hallway each time. Um, like I said, that, that's not really a good, good example. She didn't even learn anything, but that's basically why. So she needs to uh, make sure he doesn't learn anything. And so at the end of this, what we have is that Bob is convinced that there is a three color in this graph. So zero knowledge are a nice tool. And the things you might be able to use this for uh, are things like authentication. So you can imagine logging onto a website. Instead of just typing your password and sending it over the network, what if I could just prove to you that I know my password? And there's tools for this called Zero Knowledge Proofs of Knowledge. And you can basically convince somebody else that you know some secret value. And they'll never see the secret value. And the eavesdropper listening in can't derive that secret value. Because all you're conveying is one bit of information. Yes or no, I know the secret value. Another thing might be secure multi-party computation. So we could have a bunch of computers on the internet and we may all have sensitive values. We might have secrets, we might have personal information, uh, it can be anything, it's just you know, general computation. And if we all want to come together and agree or compute some function with all our inputs, uh, we might be worried about something cheating. So one way to actually do this is to send a proof that you computed this multi-party computation directly, that you're not cheating, you're not, you know, if this thing is some uh, you know, averaging protocol, you're not giving it a value that's not trying to cheat the protocol somehow. And uh, yeah, so you can use your knowledge proofs and secure multiple party computation. And finally, there's voting programs. And the nice application here is that what if we get tally votes and give you a proof that the votes were neither tampered with and tallied correctly, but didn't leak any information about what person actually voted. So next week, Ben Benedita is going to talk a bit about some voting protocols that can make use of you know, very small zero knowledge proofs that can prove that, okay, these votes were not tampered with, you know, I give them to a third party, the kind of re-randomized values that come out are still the same votes, just re-randomized. You can prove that in an efficient way. And this has been a real focus of research in computer science. There's been a lot of work on it. I've got all these adjectives on the bottom, and there are many flavors of zero knowledge. There's stronger versions, there's non-interactive ones, things about the current the protocols running where you've got multi-protocols going on at once, and it's a very kind of rich field that is still being developed, and um, a lot of things are happening in, in this area, and so it's kind of an interesting thing for the future. So kind of step back for a minute. Um, talk about things in crypto being equivalent to each other, kind of like complexity class in crypto. So some interesting results are that we've talked about almost all things like we talked about, one-way functions, metric key encryption, uh, public key signatures, we mentioned a little bit of big commitments today. And the interesting thing is that this, this first list of bullet points, all of these things are equivalent. So we can prove that there's one one-way function out there, we can construct all of these things. Maybe not efficiently, but um, they can all be constructed from each other. We can find a function that generates pseudo-random bits, meaning that looks like randomness and you can't distinguish it from randomness. Then we can build only functions. We can build symmetric key ciphers. We can build public key signatures. Now kind of, if you think of this as, as like a class of functions, there's a higher class that you know, starts with a construction called a uh, trapdoor permutation. 
This is very similar to a public key. Basically, it's a function that's easy to go in one direction and hard to go in the other. So like a one-way function, but with a trap door that makes it easy to reverse. So it's kind of like a public key where um, the function is computing and encrypting with the public key. It's difficult to decrypt unless you've got it in secret. And so this kind of standard abstract definition of trap, trap door permutation does imply public key crypto. And that public key crypto implies key agreements. So that implies things like Diffie Hellman, if any of these exist, Diffie Hellman, things like that exist. And finally, key agreement would imply one way functions. So the idea is that if somebody discovered a function that they could prove was a, a trapdoor permutation, then public key crypto exists, key agreement, one way functions. That means that all these constructions, all these uh, primitives that we've talked about, can be implemented in practice. So now, what would that actually imply to complexity classes? Um, can we ask if trapdoor permutations exist? If we can actually find a function that can satisfy the requirements? There's a lot of formal definitions for all of these. They're not, um, there's very specific things saying, okay, what is a one-way function of the trapdoor permutation? But we don't actually know if cryptography exists. If any of this can actually be done in a provable way. Things like AES and DES and SHA-1, these are kind of ad hoc constructions. There's nothing backing it saying, okay, well, you know, this must be one way. These are just things that people have you know, kind of worked on and put together functions that you know, kind of stand up to the attacks we know about. If AES is broken tomorrow, it doesn't have any big kind of theoretical implication. It doesn't mean that complexity classes collapse, collapse or anything like that. It's just, you know, we've broken some kind of ad hoc construction. But what does it mean if crypto does exist? Well, one big question it implies is that P does not equal to P. And there's a kind of exercise on the exercises that you would prove this, but basically if something like a one-way function exists, then there exists languages that can't be computed in polynomial time. And that would mean that P does not equal to P. Now kind of an interesting thing is that the, uh, the converse is not necessarily true. P not, P not equal to NP does not necessarily imply that crypto exists. And the reason is, is that you might have uh, classes in NP that are hard only in a small fraction of cases, whereas one-way functions need to be hard in the average case. So this is kind of a you know, gray area of complexity, and it's not exactly my strong field, but um, one-way functions would be, possibly be in a class that is different than NP, because they need to be hard in the average case. So, and these are very kind of theoretical issues and, and kind of coming, bringing it back to the practice. You know, what about if you know, things like factor, where do they fit in this picture? You know, where does the hardness actually come into these, these practical systems? Well, factoring, you know, let's ask the question, what happens if tomorrow somebody knows how to factor fast? Well, does that collapse P equals NP? Does that collapse, you know, does that mean we can't do crypto? And the answer is no. Uh, factoring is known to be in, in this class, it's the intersection of NP and CoNP, which is not thought to be equivalent, is not thought to be complete. So if factoring were easy tomorrow, it wouldn't necessarily mean that P equals NP. Uh, so it's, I think it's actually, you know, possible that we'll see somebody come up with an efficient factoring algorithm. Um, I would not be surprised by it. And as we mentioned a little bit in one of the questions last week, uh, factoring is easy in quantum. So this is this uh, class BQP, which means uh, basically randomized quantum polynomial time. And it's possible that BQP is equal to, you know, just regular probabilistic algorithms. So all of these things listed up here, as far as I know, as I said, complexity is not a total strong suit. But as far as I know, none of these are actually NP complete. So these are all the kind of problems that crypto is based on in practice. So tomorrow somebody can know how to figure out how to efficiently solve these. And I'm saying this in the great songs that I may be mistaken, especially on the latter ones, but um, it's kind of an interesting question because, you know, what do we do if tomorrow somebody learns how to solve all these and publishes some paper that makes these all efficient? And there is, has been some research in, you know, what you would do if people said P or how you'd actually do crypto if you know, there were no hard problems. And you could actually have some constructions that are they're very inefficient, but you could do things where it requires a certain number of steps. And so you're kind of relying on large constants in the polynomials. So just because something's polynomial time, 
doesn't mean that it actually is efficient in kind of practical sense. We have a huge constant in there. So there is hope if you know, factoring is polynomial time tomorrow. Uh, the actual algorithm to do it might be so expensive that um, no one would use it. And a good example there is primes. So for years we've known that primes, uh, good probabilistic algorithms for finding prime numbers or assigning which things prime. And these are run by doing a lot of trials and you, you know, generate some randomness. And only about five years ago we figured out that there's a deterministic algorithm for this. And the algorithm is very complicated. It's, it's you know, really slow compared to the probabilistic one. It's kind of good at analog of that. If somebody figures out how to do factoring in, in P, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be efficient practice. So this uh, talk's actually a little bit shorter than I anticipated, but um, next week, as I mentioned a couple times, it's going to be an interesting talk uh, from Benedita. He's going to talk about voting systems and uh, using a lot of the things we talked about in the Overdrive's course. Kind of mixed nets and some things like visual crypto, which is an interesting thing, and um, zero knowledge proofs, like very simple ones. And so that's pretty much all I have today. I want to open it up to any questions. And if you're on the VC, I'm actually going to go to the uh, chat window here. Um, okay, so if anyone in the room has a question, uh, please uh, feel free to ask it. Yes? Are there secure search algorithms when the search engine doesn't know what they're searching for? The question is, are there secure search algorithms? And yes, there are. And there's been a lot of work on this in kind of private database operations. And so the kind of heavy duty one is the secure multi-party computation that you can build. Basically a circuit that, you know, we can put in our search results on the inputs, and then search engine can execute the search without knowing what it is and return the result. Uh, that's really heavy duty. As I said, that's very inefficient, and its constructions are not practical yet. Secure multi-party computation is going to become more efficient in the future. But on the flip side, there are some special uh, algorithms that have been designed and special kind of protocols for doing uh, secure search. Um, some things can do secure excuse me, some things can do searches over encrypted databases. And um, yeah, there's been a lot of work on this. Any questions? Yes, Doctor? Are digital signatures examples of zero knowledge proofs? Uh, did you ask, are there signature examples of zero knowledge proofs? Yeah, digital signatures, yeah, signatures. Oh, are digital signatures an example of zero knowledge proofs? Yeah. Uh, they are not because, well, I'll take a note. There are ways you can make signature schemes that are zero knowledge, but kind of the ones we've been talking about, like in you know, DSA. Um, so signing a piece of data, uh, somebody could actually figure out what piece of data you signed. So the uh, nice thing with zero knowledge is that um, you actually get no more information. The fact that I give you a signature on it, a signature is an actual value that you send the original information, um, that actually does leak a very small amount of information to the adversary. And it's kind of a, a complicated definition, but um, the way that they do these proofs is that they kind of have a simulator and they show that you know, between Alice and Bob, uh, somebody could just simulate this, this whole, oops, they can simulate this whole protocol uh, in their head and have a protocol that's indistinguishable from the original. So um, basically, uh, yes and no. So it's the kind of digital signatures we talked about are not zero knowledge, but there are schemes out there that are. There's something on the line. So let's say there's a question. Yes, yeah, so the question on the uh, group chat is that uh, for our examples, it looks like these are probabilistic and there's a chance for us to fail. And that is true. So there's a whole class of uh, a language class out there called IP, which is Interactive Protocols. And these are probabilistic. So with these zero knowledge proof examples, um, all the examples that I have are probabilistic. And I'm un actually unaware if there's any, any sort of kind that are, are guaranteed to be solutions. But in this case, so going back to the cave example and the graph, uh, three color, Alice could just get extremely lucky. She could you know, pick, you know, know what coin box going to flip at a time and be able to pick the right tunnel in that cave. And, you know, basically you can just run this until the chance of that happening is infinitesimal. You can do it a hundred times and uh, you can just believe that with extremely high probability, uh, Alice didn't get lucky. But, um, 
it's a good question. What is a proof? And that these are you know, probabilistic. These are not like mathematical proofs. And they're not like a certificate type of proof. These are the proof is actually engaging this protocol. So it's kind of an interesting complexity class, uh, IP, which is um, if you're kind of into complexity theory, it's equivalent to all the algorithms that use polynomial space. So it's equivalent to P space. Interesting thing is that everything in that class can actually be proven with zero knowledge. And everything in NP, which is a subclass, has a zero knowledge proof. Okay, so are there more questions in the room? Uh, yes, right here. So, uh, how about it? Okay, so you're going back to the Cave example, and the question is, what information does Bob get when Alice comes out? Uh, I think in this protocol, actually, she doesn't see, he doesn't see which side she went into. If he does, then um, I think the protocol would work the same, actually. He still, I guess he would always pick. So yeah, part of the protocol is her, him not knowing which uh, yeah. tunnel she's in. If, if he went, if she's, or if he saw which door, which hall she went in, he would always pick the opposite. Right. Yeah. So that's not problem in that case, yeah. So that that cave example is kind of a, a toy example, and so the graph uh, three color ability is a little bit, um, you know, more realistic. Uh, and that, I think that example, I can't think of a good reason why you'd say, okay, why doesn't he just see which time she goes in? Um, right. Yes, back there. Yeah, but you you might just be able to guess that Bob has figured out what Alice's random number generator is. Right, so if he controls a random number generator, it's the same thing. And if you think about the three color ability one, uh, if he controls a random number generator then, then he knows how she's relabeling that graph, and he can work backwards and figure out what the actual three color is. So Alice having an independent source of randomness is essential in the three color uh, protocol, because if not, then Bob can extract the actual information. And that's kind of a neat thing about zero knowledge proof. The random number yeah. generator is needed both ways. Yes, the random number generator is needed both ways. If you can predict which ones he's going to ask about, then you can pick a graph that has those yeah, two with different numbers. Exactly. So it works both ways. ways. If Alice knows Bob's random numbers, she knows what he's going to guess. So you go back to the cave example. If she knows that Bob always picks A, she's just going to go down A, even if she doesn't know the password. Uh, in the random graph, in the three column graph, um, she knows what edge he's going to pick. She'll always just color the graph, whatever, and then color those two nodes uh, to be different colors. And this is actually an interesting thing is how they do proofs for this is, you know, this idea that when you're simulating this, we talked a little bit about the simulation paradigm. Um, you can control the randomness and then basically rewind Bob. Bob would be like a Turing machine, and you rewind it back to the original state and then run it forward. And it's kind of a, a technique you can use in these proofs. And uh, on the wiki, I have kind of an introduction to zero knowledge. And it's, it's pretty dense, but like kind of the first, first few sections are, are pretty accessible. And then really want to get into it, there's just tons of material there. Yes, what's your question? The uh, probabilistic random number, or prime number tests are, are very similar to the zero knowledge group. Yeah, so it's the same idea with the uh, try this, prime knowledge tests. Test. Uh, if it is not a prime, each, each guess has, yeah, you can't think, prove it is not prime if it isn't. Right, so the, the question or the comment was that kind of this whole idea of a proof is similar to the way that you would test primality if you use the miller rabin test. And or recall correctly, if it's a prime, it'll never fail. And if it's a composite, it will fail except with a small probability. I might have that backwards. But it's the same thing. You might just get really unlucky testing a number. And you're going to miss you know, that it's, it's actually a composite. Um, and this class of language, I might have I think it's RP, where the errors only on one side. That's a yeah, it's a complexity class that contains P. Are there are uh, more questions. So it seems to uh, to be that if you try to uh, color uh, prove that you can color graph, but you try to cheat, that you uh, uh, will uh, will uh, have mistakes on large amount of nodes. It's so, like if graph is super large and you color all of it except like one edge, you can get away with that. Right, so the question is in the graph coloring, uh, you know, what's your probability of getting away with it? Let, let's say we had a graph that 
I knew how to color everything, but I just had one, one edge that I couldn't color. Well, then the probability of getting caught each round is the number of edges. And so if there's an end node graph, it's going to be you know, order of n squared edges. And so that would actually be the basis of how many rounds we're going to do. And so you do some function of the number of edges, uh, and do as many rounds, and get the confidence that you want. Um, right. The kind of interesting thing is that there's some interesting results with graph non-isomorphisms and proving that a graph is not isomorphic. Uh, you can do some zero-knowledge proofs for this, and that's actually not an NP. There's no way to give somebody a certificate proving that a graph is not isomorphic. So that's kind of one of the interesting things about this, too, is that I can use zero-knowledge proofs for things that aren't computable uh, in, in our way we look at it, the way we can actually do things. But you need to relabel the graph. It's very hard to tell if anything it, even if you relabel the graph, it's hard to tell it's the same graph. Yes, and uh, in this case, you don't need, you're not permuting the nodes, but um, I mentioned graph not isomorphism. The, the proof for, uh, this is actually kind of an interesting thing, is, is the way I would do a zero proof for graph isomorphism. Um, what I do is I encrypt or commit to every single edge. And so I'd have this complete graph, but have every node with every possible edge uh, be an encryption. And there's two challenges. So in this case, Bob can either ask me to show him, actually this is a, a cycle through the graph. This is how I prove that a graph has a cycle, which is another NP complete problem, is Bob would either challenge me to reveal the cycle, so I'd, I'd open up uh, an edge that would you know, have a path through the whole graph, or he can just ask me to reveal the whole graph and then show that it's, it's the actual graph. So you know, if I tried to cheat and, and gave him a graph that didn't have a cycle, he would catch me you know, half the time. And if I tried to give him, if I tried to do anything else, he'd catch me the other half. Is there a question behind you, I think? No. Right. Any more uh, questions? Yes, over here. Oh, online. <laughs> uh, follow on question, would you trust an authentication scheme, which is already, which was only probabilistic uh, yes, I would if uh, you know, the probabilistic means that I, you can drive it up as much as you want. So it's like flipping coins. So if you say, you know, would I trust something except in the case where I flip 100 heads in a row? Yeah, I trust it because it's not going to happen in your lifetime. Um, and all crypto systems are probabilistically accurate, right? Yeah, I mean, and, and if you look at it this way, every crypto system is probabilistically accurate. You know, there's always the case where Somebody has an exponential chance of just guessing a key on the first try, and then you know, that's it. Um, with the exception of information theory and the secure things. So, any other questions? All right, well, I'll, I'll wrap it up. And then, uh, as I said, next week I really encourage you to come to the talk. It should be interesting. Ben's a good speaker, and it should you know, kind of tie together a lot of things we've talked about in this course. And uh, if you have any questions, feel free to email me. Thank you.